Hello again, and welcome to another edition of Media Watch. I'm your co-host, Eric Tate. I'm Bob Anthony. And I'm Raymond Peterson. I'm their guest and friend, Alan Singer. And this is being brought to you by the good graces of EVT Educational Productions, Manhattan Neighborhood Network, and Zoom. Uh, and one of the things, oh yes, yeah, just before we actually get into our topic of note, uh, which you guys will recognize, uh, let's just do a quick follow-up to our last show uh, on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And so there's no confusion or misunderstanding. None of us here on Media Watch was advocating or has ever advocated that Hamas be given help to assault Israel in any way at any time with rockets or any other weapons, period. Ineffectual though they may be, these Hamas rockets do sometimes kill innocent Israeli civilians. But the fact that US aid to Israel militarily and otherwise far outstrips anything we provide the Palestinian people is what I personally have been railing about and calling out on Media Watch all these years. The fact that Israeli, quote, retaliatory, unquote, ground offensives and airstrikes disproportionately kill innocent Palestinians, young and old, is what we have called out and railed about on Media Watch. Yes, Israel as a country has a right to exist. Hamas needs to turn that page and acknowledge that. The Palestinians as a displaced people need to not only have their right to a state of their own, become an actuality, a real state, but they also need real acknowledgement and compensation for so many lives lost, lands and infrastructure being destroyed and unfortunately still being taken from them. Amen, period. That being said, the parallels of airstrikes killing innocent civilians and lands and infrastructure being destroyed and taken without reparations and compensation brings us back to the United States and what folks have been talking about quite a bit recently, the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. And Bob, you got something to say on that, don't you? I mean, it's been so well covered. It's been so well covered this week uh, in the, on the network news and the, in the newspapers. And as we uh, tape here on Wednesday before the Monday air, it's one day after President Biden had a lot to say about it. And if you listen to that speech, I thought he acquitted himself fairly well in getting into how we just can't forget this. It can't, you know, those who say, well, it was 100 years ago, let's just leave it at that. No, no, it's, it's so many aspects of this we have to uh, keep in our hearts and, and not let go. A lot of people don't have wealth today because their wealth was stolen. I mean, that's just one minor aspect. It's the lives that were lost is the real thing. So it's been quite a week of uh, memories and uh, digging up, uh, you know, uh, reports. And what was it? Two survivors of the massacre at, were three, at the meeting three, with Biden. So that's Biden, quite impressive. Three, there were three, three survivors three? who were there. One was 107 uh, and one was over, and the other two were both over 100. One might have been exactly 100. But the bottom line, the bottom, uh, a little bit over 100. Uh, but Ray, yeah. you were researching, and I mean, you don't, you can set up Alan because Alan's done more research on this than most of us. But what did you find when you started researching so we could broaden this out so people would understand it's not just Tulsa? It's not just Tulsa. And uh, there are so many, we don't have time to list all of them. I mean, it would take days. And I'm not, I'm not going to go through the details, but people were murdered for simply assembling at courthouses and things like that. I'm going, to, I'm going to just give you a list of some of the major ones. Colfax, Louisiana, 1873. Wilmington, North Carolina, 1898. Um, Atlanta, 1906. Elaine, Arkansas, and that's when people want to really want to look at Elaine, Arkansas, 1919. 
And uh, like I said, you know, it, it just goes on. Rosewood, Florida. That's another one that I, people have heard about. But there are so many. That, you know, one of my favorites that I'm sure when Alan does his slideshow, we will have quite you know, visuals on is the New York City draft riots of 1863. That is so, I'm so versed on that because that's like basically the conclusion of the I'll be free to travel home. The, 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 the whole historical arc from colonial New York to the, the, the Civil War when those Irish, predominantly Irish mobs were upset about being drafted to go fight to end slavery and they just ride it. And as, as Professor Adele Alexander said, what started out as a riot against government drafting turned into a humongous race riot. Uh, but Alan, you've got a historical arc that you have done as an educator, uh, I'm sure more than once. Give us a little background on why you prepared it. And, and we don't have to run the whole thing because we're a half hour show, 28 minute show, but you can selectively screen that stuff for us and put it in historical context so people understand the historical arc on these kinds of atrocities against predominantly black communities. I'm teaching a class this semester for teachers at Hofstra on teaching about race in America. And we started with the 1619 curriculum. And one of the questions that come up is, it's pretty clear the impact of slavery on the history of the United States. But the question that students are grappling with, these are teachers, is its ongoing continued impact on the United States. Mm -hmm. So I put together a PowerPoint to kind of address these things. I'll, I'll pull it up. Yeah, let's, let's share some of that with our Media Watch audience. Because that will, I mean, we as journalists can talk about what we've researched and, and actually done documentary-wise and covered modern-wise, but to do a historical primer is insightful. In July 1967, H. Rap Brown, who at the time was the chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was giving a press conference and he was excoriated for this one because in the conference, he says, and I quote, I say, violence is necessary. Violence is a part of America's culture. It is as American as cherry pie. Americans taught Black people to be violent. We will use that violence to rid ourselves of oppression if necessary. We will be free by any means necessary. If you look back in US history, you realize that H. Raph Brown was right on. Violence was used to oppress, to terrify African Americans from the original settlement. Um, in Montgomery, Alabama, there's the National Memorial for Peace Justice. And it's an incredible exhibit if you get to visit it. There are 805 suspended steel rectangles. Each represents a county in the United States where between 1877, which is the end of Reconstruction, 1950, there are over 4,000 documented lynchings of African Americans. Now, individuals were killed, but this was also done to terrorize entire communities into submission and subservience. Now, one of the things that's so striking, what they did to exhibit is not only do they have the suspensions, but they collected dirt and ash from all the sites and they have it in jars. And these are all one jar for each of the sites where people were murdered. But again, they were murdered, but communities were terrified. This is an image of uh, one of the Florida lynchings. And one of the things that is beyond the death is the lynchers brought their children to the murder sites to indoctrinate them into white supremacy. 
So you, you're looking at in the lower right, I'm looking at in the lower right of this mm -hmm. right, what seems like an innocent looking young white child and behind the lynch person are these white males in their boater, straw, Panama, whatever kinds of hats, looking very casual. And actually, if you look closely, there's another body hanging behind those three men that are standing there looking so casual. Am I, I'm, I'm not missing. That's another body hanging back there. Is it? I'm Look carefully. Sure. Look carefully. I see. Is it? I, I, are you talking about the the guy who's leaning no. against the tree? Between the guy leaning, both guys leaning against the tree. Look behind that. Behind them, yeah. I, Look. I, I don't know if he's hanging or if that's just his his butt in the screen. I don't know. No, no. I he he is about. See, I can see the bottom of his feet suspended above the ground, just like this guy in the foreground. These were just casual occurrences. The tree. They, yeah. They were matter of fact, and that's what's so scary. When you look, it's it's not just death. It's not just the the terrorism. This is a this is terrorism, but it's a casual. It's a matter of fact when they bring their children to the events. Yeah. Now but, you mentioned New York because New York had its share of these horrific events. 1741, when New York is still a British colony. Uh, the white population is fearful of a black uprising. And what they do is they end up executing 35 Africans for suspected a plot. Um, that was a so-called slave black. rebellion. That yeah. was a so-called slave rebellion of 1741. Yeah. It never yeah. happened. Yeah, that, that's in, that's in, in, then I'll be free to travel home as well. No, 14 were burned alive and they families, white families brought their children to the spectacle. This is a contemporary woodcut of what was taking place. They did and the same thing that, after the slave revolt of 1712. Folks were drawn and quartered and burned at the stake and folks came like it was a picnic to celebrate. That's New York, New York City, folk. This is not the deep South. 1712, 1741. Go ahead, Alan. Okay. This is during the American Civil War. Um, this, the Battle of Fort Pillow takes place just outside of Memphis, Tennessee. And it's an important location because it controls traffic on the Mississippi River. It had been taken by the Union forces and the battalion stationed to protect it were African-American troops with white officers because during the Civil War, African-Americans could not be officers. Confederate counterforce under General uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest retook the fort and they massacred the, all the African-Americans that they took prisoner. These were prisoners of war in American uniforms were summarily massacred by Confederate forces under Forrest, Bedford Forrest, who later becomes a founder of the KKK. That's what I was and, about to ask you. Isn't he one of those early KKK founders? This, this Confederate lionized person, don't they have statues to him somewhere dotted through the Confederacy? There's a statue of him in the Tennessee State House mm -hmm. that representatives are trying to have removed. Okay. But they, you know they don't want to erase history of their southern heroes. Yeah. Again, you reference this also, um, Eric. 1863, when the draft is instituted in New York, and it's politically it's done very stupidly. It's done right after the Battle of Gettysburg. The entire New York Irish Brigade is wiped out at Gettysburg, and now they're drafting more people. So the Irish of New York riot. But what happens is one of the targets, the city police protect the wealthy. They protect the munitions plants. So the riot loots and burns the black orphanage. Amongst and, other locations. <laughs> yes, this is the, the, again, the most frightening. I mean, they steal food and bedding. We're talking about the rioters are impoverished. But they, they turn on the black population and black men are lynched in the street of New York in 
July 1863. Lynched and shot. Now, many of the, much of the black population eventually flees to Brooklyn, and that's where Weeksville becomes very, very important. Thomas Nast, who's a cartoonist, political cartoonist for Harper's Weekly at the time, he looks at the violence against African Americans who are now free after the Civil War. There are attacks in um, Memphis, New Orleans, um, across Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, Atlanta, North Carolina. And Thomas Nast argues that the effort to set up a white man's government in the South by the White League and the KKK, he said, calls it worse than slavery. And just for those people who don't know, Thomas Nass was the premier editorial cartoonist of his age. Yes. I mean, he brought down government with his cartoons, and he was one of the 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 more learned of the of the illustrators of that uh, of that period. So this is a very good. I had never seen this one by Nass. He's had so many historic ones, but uh, didn't mean to interrupt, uh, Alan, no, go, go ahead. No, but, but Alan, you, you, I remember when we were dealing with some of the reconstruction stuff and uh, Dr. Foner, Eric Foner was one of our resource experts for the Every Voice and Sing. And he flatly stated that the Knights of the White Camellia the KKK and similar groups were basically domestic terrorist organizations inflicting yes. nothing but terrorism on blacks during reconstruction to end black upward mobility and black first class citizenship. He flat out states that. And that cartoon illustrates it perfectly. Yes. Now, the NAACP and the National Park Service have been putting up um, markers to commemorate some of these sites. This, but again, not by local governments. This is put up by the NAACP in Memphis. In, in May 1866, mobs of white men led by law enforcement attacked black people and they killed at least 46. They raped women. They burned 91 dwellings, Memphis, Tennessee, the same location as Fort Pillow. This is a woodcut of New Orleans where white mobs just went through the neighborhood executing African-Americans. Colfax. This is 1873. Uh, by the state government. On this site occurred the Colfax riot, which three white men, as you pointed out, they always lead with the white men. 150 Negroes were slain. It marked the end of carpetbag misrule in the South. Well, okay. Uh, three white men and 150 Negroes were slain. Um, it, the three white men got killed when the Negroes fought back? Is that what we're assuming? <laughs> well, they, that's true, but it also may have been whites who allied with the black population. Okay, all because right. The carpetbaggers were northerners who had gone down south to, among other things, help to teach African Americans how to read. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the carpetbaggers have gotten a line because there were instances of nefarious monetary gain, et cetera, et cetera, which overshadows the fact that a whole lot of people went south to help educate the and the formerly enslaved black population and teach help teach them. And those were quote carpet baggers from the north as well coming down. But all those people who went south got painted with that bad brush. Um, so it it's good when you can shed light on the fact that not everybody went down there to thieve. They did, went down there to help as well. Yes. Bob, how much time do we have left? Uh, we have uh, we have about uh, eight minutes. Because there are a couple of quotes before uh, we're done. Uh, a couple of quotes from Wilmington residents who took place 
in the riots that I would like to. Alan, do you have a Wilmington slide? That, okay, this is New Orleans commemorating the assassination <laughs> of black soldiers. This is Wilmington. Uh, this is the white rioters posing after the Wilmington riot. This is 1898. Yeah, after Ray government Wilmington. was elected in 1896, I believe. A mixed race government that the white yeah. supremacist racist mob did not like. You got some stuff on that, Raymond? I got, I got a couple of quotes from people who participated. Uh, quote, the men who took down their shotguns and cleared the Negroes out of office yesterday were not a mob, mob of pug uglies. They were men of property, intelligence, culture, clergymen, lawyers, bankers, merchants. They are not a mob. They are revolutionists asserting a sacred privilege and a right. Another participant of that says, if we have to choke the current of the Cape Fear, that's the river there, right? In Wilmington. If we have to choke the current of the Cape Fear with carcasses, Negro domination shall henceforth be only a shameful memory to us and an everlasting warning to those who shall ever again seek to receive it. So that Negro domination was their reference to the fact that a duly elected government had been voted in office and many of those people, a good many of those people were black people elected to that right. Wilmington city government. So Wilmington was already a very prosperous town. Uh, the blacks outnumbered the whites. There were black doctors, firemen, policemen. I, I mean, uh, it was a regular community. The white people thought that they were losing control. Normal Dr. people go crazy when crap like that happens. Dr. Heather Williams, when she talked to us for Every Voice and Sing, she said, basically, whenever Blacks got prosperous, raised themselves above where white people thought they should be, white people decided they would riot and destroy their communities. Her quote was, before the 20th century, riots in this country weren't Black people rioting in cities, with white people riding and destroying black towns and black mobility, black upward mobility. And she's correct. Uh, I don't know how much more time we have, but Alan, after Wilmington, there was the early 20th century before 1921, there was the red summer of 1919. Do you have some slides from the red summer of 1919? Just before I want to mention one other one, 1910, Jack Johnson, <laughs> that was incredible. <laughs> he defeated James Jeffries, a white former champion. Great, great, great. Anti black riots in Atlanta, Cincinnati, Chicago, Columbus, Houston, Los Angeles, New Orleans, New York, Philadelphia, and St. Louis because the white guy lost the fight. That's 1910. 1910. Okay. Okay. In and that's before World War I. And then what happens is World War I shows up. Everybody goes off to fight to help the country, including black men. And black men go just like they had fought in every war. Even before this country was a country, they went to help defend because they did it in New York in colonial times. They did it in other colonies when they were fighting against the natives to help preserve white property and maybe some of their own land patents. But Every war they went off to, so World War I, they went off to fight. But when they came home, they kept their guns. What yeah. happened in 1919? <laughs> when when the, the white people decide they're still going to try to destroy Black communities? Black people had migrated north to the war industries, but also Black people who fought in the war were not prepared to put up with that crap. And the whites turned on them, and they... The worst is Chicago, but again, they just burned the black communities in Chicago. So this is the 100th anniversary of Tulsa, but we're not just talking about Tulsa. Right. We're talking about what goes on throughout American history. It's what H. Rap Brown was saying, that violence against African-Americans is as American as cherry pie. It's not new in Tulsa, and it has not stopped since Tulsa. And I think that's 
the other piece. That's the Black Lives Matter movement today. In the 1990s, in the United States, police were militarized to patrol and control Black communities. And we have about uh, two and a half minutes. So, Alan, what you just said about police being militarized to patrol and control Black communities, that takes me back to last week I heard a young lady on a PBS broadcast with Judy Woodruff, and she had three guests on, and this expert that she had was an Asian woman. She looked like Asian Hispanic. I don't remember her name. But when Judy said, well, what's, what's the root cause of all this? She said exactly what we've been saying. You, Alan, me, Bob, Ray. The root of policing in this country comes straight out of the slave patrols that were instituted to try to recapture or to try to maintain and control enslaved Africans. And the Second Amendment that they passed was strictly to make sure those folks could have those guns to go ahead and shoot, kill, bring those enslaved people back. There's a new book out, which I'm sorry I didn't write the title down, that's just been reviewed in the New York Times book review about the Second Amendment, and it's called The Second. And the thesis of that book basically is that they passed that amendment to make sure they could control and maintain those black bodies that were enslaved. So I don't know how much time we got left, but Alan, you want to wrap it up and we'll sign off? We have about a minute. Go ahead. By Elizabeth Hinton, who's a professor of history and law at Yale. Great. Black urban rebellions. She says, I don't call them riots, I call them rebellions, starting in Watts, Newark, and Detroit in the 60s. And she argues they are a systematic response to oppression and police violence in Black communities. And although the 1968 Kerner Commission report, it called for um, structural change in policing, social welfare programs, employment, education, health care as solutions to explosive racial equality. The policy the government implemented under both Democrats and Republicans under George H.W. under George H.W. Bush and under Bill Clinton was militarization of the police. I mean, Okay, we're about, I think we're about out of time. Yes. Yep. All right, yes. Alan, this yes. is a great presentation. Those teachers that you are teaching will learn well, and hopefully they will teach well. This has been Media Watch. I'm your co-host, Eric Tate. I'm Bob Anthony. I'm Raymond Peterson. Alan Singer, their, their guest, their friend, but also historian. And we'll catch you the next time, folks. Stay safe.